Kelsey Blackwell, welcome to the Creation for Liberation podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Tetna. I'm happy to be here. Me too. All right. So tell me, jumping right into it, what does decolonizing mean to you today? Mm -hmm. It means a couple things. I think the first piece is reclaiming our inherent indigeneity. So regardless of the color of your skin, you are indigenous to some place. And uh, your indigenous ancestors had a way that they were able to survive uh, through relating to the land, uh, living harmoniously with others, um, engaging in ritual and sense-making practices to help them understand their place in this world. So for me, there's that's at the root is what does it mean to be a human animal? What does it mean to uh, be of this place, to know that we actually do belong uh, and that that belonging comes with some responsibilities that we have disconnected from through the impacts of colonization. So there's that. And I think that's a really important place to start because in reclaiming our indigeneity, you know, that may land differently for different people, but I think it also, at least for me, it lands as a relief. It's like, oh, okay, you know, this narrative of being outside, I'm outside of something, um, I, I don't belong, is actually an impact of systems of supremacy. Uh, and the truth is that I do belong and that my people have historically belonged and that they had a relationship to this land. And even though I may not know the practices of my people, I can honor uh, that those practices live in me. And by reconnecting to myself more deeply, I can um, feel for what those practices may be, which I say more about in the book. And there's an inherent, to me, um, celebration in that. There's an inherent sense of connecting with joy and wonder and possibility. And I think that that disposition or that ground, that attitude is a really important way to enter in to healing work um, and to uh, exploring the impacts of systemic oppression. Because so oftentimes we enter in and there's this sense of like, it's heavy and it's hard and it's heartbreaking and there's so much grief. And that is true. But what gives us the sustainability to be with that heaviness and process that grief is this connection to a possibility, is this connection to joy, is this connection to uh, reclaiming the ways that our ancestors told stories and sang songs and looked up at the night sky, right? And so there's that. The other piece of this work um, is really from a place of possibility, from a place of inspiration, starting to feel for what are the ways that I've internalized narratives of harm? And the truth is that we all have internalized these narratives. And uh, some of our internalization of these narratives comes from a place of survival, that we had to learn how to not be too big, not, not uh, draw too much attention to ourselves, um, to be of service, uh, to not show our anger. We had to do these things. And I'm speaking um, particularly about bodies of color because that's the lens that I am navigating the world from. But these impacts actually show up in all bodies, even bodies that are uh, privileged, though they may be different. The impacts may be different depending on how we're uh, racialized and genderized. But we've all... Uh, um, been impacted by the systems that we live in and have internalized some of these narratives. And this internalization shows up not just in our thinking, but actually how we are in our bodies, 
how we even relate to our bodies. And so some of this journey of decolonization, at least decolonizing the body, is starting to look at how do, how do these narratives show up in me? And can I, with uh, kindness, with gentleness, start to uh, feel for the larger impacts of why these patterns have shown up? And then take steps toward a reclamation of who I really know myself to be or who I long to be or what it is in, within me that's ready to emerge. And I think kindness and gentleness is the next really important piece of this work because, you know, in my work with clients, very often, you know, they're aware of these patterns that they're in. They're aware that uh, their boundaries are, you know, not as strong as they want them to be. And they keep saying yes when they want to say no, um, that they're overworked and they're tired or that they have good ideas, but um, they can't find their confidence in bringing those ideas forward. And uh, what I call the program in the book, which is really the colonialist, imperialist, white supremacist, transphobic patriarchy. <laughs> it's just easier to say the program than, <laughs> you know, we could add some more things on there too, I'm sure. But the what the program makes us believe is that if we're not thriving, then it's because there's something faulty or deficient within ourselves. If we're not at peace, then um, it's because uh, there's something wrong with us. And so we show up and oftentimes there's that sense of aggression is actually one of the ways in which we internalize the program is by uh, showing up to this work and being super dedicated to fixing ourselves. Uh, and um, I like to offer a really zoomed out perspective that ah, this, this way of being isn't actually of your doing. This isn't actually connected to something being wrong or faulty within yourself. This is a survival um, technique. Mm -hmm. And it's a, probably a survival technique that you learn from your parents and they from their parents and so on and so forth. And when we see it that way, it gives us access to, I hope, more understanding, more compassion for ourselves. And um, that's how we enter into this internal work from a place of gentleness and kindness, compassion, and curiosity. Mm. Thank you. There's so much there, so much richness and flavor. Um, I'd love to also touch on those different points. After I ask this question, how are you holding the both and of exploring your own indigeneity and I'm asking this as both an immigrant and a settler here of indigeneity with some fragments of my lineage in South Africa, in India, and now here living on Turtle Island. How are you holding the both end of exploring your indigeneity, uh, which I'm curious about specifically, and then also the indigeneity of the land that you and I are both on here on Ohlone Muwekba tribal lands? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a little bit about my background. My people are from Nigeria and Con the Congo and Ghana, um, the West African di diaspora um, it really shows up in my family line, you know, lots of West African countries. Those are just the ones where um, I have a predominant percentage of my, my line. And then uh, I also have Scandinavian ancestry, which I find very curious. Um, and German ancestry, uh, French ancestry. And a little, so interestingly, on, I did this 23andMe test and uh, a trace of um, South Asian ancestry, which I'm also very curious about where that comes from. Um, so, so there has often been this, you know, um, feeling, especially when I was growing up, that I didn't belong, you know, and I grew up in a very white, very conservative community. I grew up in Utah. Um, so, you know, and I talk about this in the book, how I really uh, went through the motions, as I think many of us do, who um, straddle uh, cultures or straddle racial identities. Um, we, we 
are looking for what is it we have to do to fit in. And oftentimes that journey is subconscious. Um, sometimes it's very conscious, but it's for me, it was not something I knew I was doing, but it was like, oh, if I wear the right clothes, if I listen to the right music, if I have my hair just so. Mm-hmm. So there is this, there has long been this bone deep hunger to understand where do all of my pieces belong? And as I got closer to understanding where my people are from, that led me to want to explore those traditions. Like, okay, what is Ifa and Yoruba and the Orishas? Um, You know, uh, what are the indigenous practices of the Dakara people? Um, I even uh, became, you know, it's interesting as I reflect on this because it's like, of course, but early on in my 20s, I was um very very connected to the um the bun tradition of mongolia which uh is uh was part of my buddhist community and i can reflect on that and understand why i was like oh you know here i am with a bunch of white buddhists and we're all doing these indigenous practices and none of us actually are part of this culture but we all have this longing to connect with some some um intact system and so there's a a, a, we've been drawn to it like moss to a flame and um i was uh, in that number so where i am now you know is this understanding that for so long, I was looking outside of myself for my belonging, which I think is really natural to do. Um, and it was both a, a blessing and a challenge that my racial identity meant that I was never going to find full belonging in any one community. You know, I, I could be in this white space, but everyone knows I'm not I'm not white. I'm, you know, like uh, clearly racialized as black. And I can be in this black space, but oh, also I have white ancestry. And also there are ways in which I experienced the sense of um, racial imposter syndrome, where it was like, oh, am I black enough? Oh, I I didn't grow grow up with those cultural references. Uh, I don't know those foods. I don't don't know that vernacular. So I, I would feel outside of that. And the pain and the heartbreak of that really led me to understand that my belonging really can only be found internally and um, connecting with how my ancestors live within me. So while they come from these disparate lineage streams, uh, within my body, there is congruency because I am here and I am alive and um, I am uh, deeply spiritual and connected to a place. So one of the things I introduce in the book is really this opportunity for all bodies to be on this internal journey of, uh, what does it mean if I create the space for ritual, if I create the space for honoring the land, and even if I don't know the words or I don't know the songs, if I create this space and just see what comes forward, just see what naturally is birthed from that pregnant pause. And what I believe and have seen in my own life is that the more that I make that time to connect with that, what lives within me, the more something does come forward and the more I can trust it. And there is a sense of, ah, yeah, I'm in relationship with the more than human world when I'm in these practices. Yes, I am feeling for the the songs of my people, uh, the the movements of my people. And at the same time, I'm listening to the land and spirit and um, the cosmos, you know, and there's a, a deep sense of connection when I when I'm in that place that has become a requirement for me <laughs> um, to navigate my life, uh, that that is where I found, find ground. So right now, the practices that I'm in um, 
are really, you know, um, I have a, a movement practice that I do. I have um, ritual practices that I do. I have uh, sacred places that I visit and exchange, um, you know, uh, receive from, from the place and also offer. And that offering comes from a place of listening. Oh, okay, do you need breath? Do you need water? Do you want me just to sit and feel and be with you? And all of this I talk about in the book of like, okay, well, how how does one go about, <laughs> you know, creating that for themselves? And uh, the other piece of that obviously is, you know, attending to and caring for the, um, or honoring the um, original stewards of the land, you know? So um, what are the names of the indigenous peoples where we live? And uh, in what ways can I, as a, you know, settler in some sense on this land, uh, honor their caretaking? And so, you know, I think there's ways we can do that both in our spiritual practice, and then there are ways we can do that through our activism. Mm. Yes. Um, so the book that Kelsey has been referring to is Decolonizing the Body, Healing Body-Centered Practices for Women of Color to Reclaim Confidence, Dignity, and Self-Worth. Um, honored to have been able to receive this from you, Kelsey. Um, so I recommend folks check it out. But I am curious to know from you, maybe it's a relation you have with a piece of the land, with a plant or whatever it is that you're in relationship with that you give and receive from. I'd love for you to share a little bit more about that relationship and how you mm. are in communion with it, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, you know, this practice of connecting with a landscape comes from my sense of wanting to build a feeling of community. And I was writing that book during the pandemic, um, pre-pandemic, I was very involved in community. And on some level, it was actually a relief when um, those pressures, I no longer felt those pressures and I could actually come back to myself. And on the other side of the lockdowns, there has been a lot of question of, okay, well, what is what is community, you know, like, and not community in the sense of like, these are people I hang out with, but like beloved community, which I identify as a sense of mutual care, a recognition that our, um, our health and thriving is commingled and that um, there's a willingness to share resources, which is, a rare thing in the human world, but not uh, um, but not impossible. And and I hope in some ways where we're going, uh, I could say more about that at some point. But there was also this understanding that even though I felt somewhat isolated, um, I was, I'm as all as we all are. Com completely interwoven by interconnection and interconnection. The truth of interconnection is what has allowed me to be alive and, and well in this moment. All of these uh, relationships that um, some I'm aware of and some that I'm not. And so if interconnection is true, if, if, my ability to be here is dependent on the many beings um, who are also living their lives and doing their part, then what would it mean to connect with community with that root understanding um, to foster those relationships with a sense of care? And that helped me feel less like there was something missing around community and more like, oh, there's something for me to discover here. There's a there's some beings and some places 
that are just waiting for my recognition. Mm -hmm. And as I uncover them, I can tend to those relationships with intention uh, so that rather than their sustaining of my, my being being this thing that's kind of happening without me really knowing or acknowledging it, there can be a recognition of the of their offering. And at the same time, I can show up in exchange with them. Ah, okay, how can I be here for you? And that has helped me feel very much a part of something, um, very much a part of this world. I do not feel lonely. Sometimes I am alone, but I do not feel lonely because I have friends all around me. So mm -hmm. I went on a bit of a journey in my neighborhood and um, with, the, with the lens of what are the relationships, what are the beings, what are the places that are feeding me? And um, let me formalize this relationship. And so I identified two places. Um, one of them is uh, this grove of redwood trees that's at the top of a hill. And I live uh, near the ocean. And so the sun comes up and uh, uh, it doesn't reach my house until it comes over this particular hill. And so I like to go there some mornings and be with my tree friends uh, and watch the sun come up. It felt important to me that it that there was um, a, a place where I could greet the day, you know, uh, that, that's touching the, the sun kisses first. And so when I go there, um, I greet each of the trees and I offer some breath. Uh, I sit and just listen to what's happening. Um, and I also say I live in San Francisco, so I'm not, it's not like I'm going away. Like life is happening all around me. People are there with their dogs and sometimes there's construction and there's a high school nearby and, you know, kids are walking to school and, um, you know, I like that life is happening all around while I'm there. It's like, it makes it less precious. It makes it to me more like every day. I'm like, okay, you know, like this is just part of living my life and navigating my day is here we all are. Um, and then I'll often do some movement with the tree, uh, with the trees. And that movement is, uh, a movement meditation of moving my body, however it's called to move. Um, then I will uh, say goodbye and I'll always pick up if there's any trash around or, you know, I take care. I, I'm like, okay, what do we need? Do we need some water? Do we need a little trash pickup? Do we need the, the you know, the um, mulch to be spread a little bit more? Um so that's what that looks like. And what I find is that when I haven't gone there, I'll, I miss them. I'm like, oh, yes, my friends. I haven't seen my friends. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. I feel so like tenderized and inspired by everything that you just shared, Kelsey. Um, just remembering that even just looking outside my window now and seeing some of the leaves dancing with the breeze. It's like, I have someone right here, like right next to me outside the window that is acknowledging me in its own way. And I'm acknowledging it in this moment. And just hearing you name the trees as your friends whom you miss, whom you take care of and whom you offer breath to. I heard you say that a few times today, already twice, offering breath as something yeah. of value, of significance, of gift. Mm -hmm. That just feels really refreshing, especially as I myself am doing 
some reflection and engaging in just my way of being as valid in stillness, in listening, in quietness with others, knowing that I don't have to perform, I don't have to smile, I don't have to make a joke or give them something tangible to be of value to them, and that my breath can be enough sometimes. Mm -hmm. That just feels really moving to hear as something that the trees need. They need our breath in a way, like they physically benefit from it. And it is enough. That's right. Thank you, Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So walking down a parallel path, but a different one with you about being on the other side of having released your book, given your book to the world to do what it must with it. <laughs> Something that you've labored over through the pandemic, over time, in your own discovery. How are you cultivating your belonging? How are you finding beloved community? perhaps two different questions or maybe the same in this vulnerable act of offering your creation to the world and being with, with that phase of the creative process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unexpected. I think <laughs> would be the best word to say, you know, I think writing a book, I had some unknown um, or subconscious ideas about what it would feel like on the other side. And I was definitely looking forward to being on the other side. I was like, oh my gosh, okay. The book comes out March 1st. Oh, this huge relief. Oh my God, I can't wait. And, um, you know, life never gives us what we expect, <laughs> at least not <laughs> very rarely. <laughs> so um, for me, finishing the book, while there is something to acknowledge that, you know, something is, there's a celebration there and, and being on the other side of such a big process there is also a, a sense of loss. Uh, being in the creative space was actually a really beautiful space for me. Uh, I felt very connected to the world. I felt very connected to my guides and my ancestors. And I really enjoy playing with language. And it was, there was a labor there for sure, but uh, I really felt like I was right where I needed to be. It was, there was no question. It was like, ah, yeah, I'm really well used right now. Like this feels like what I'm here to do. And on the other side, all of that um, stability is not present. <laughs> At least it's not for me. Uh, the, there's a release and there's this big question of like, okay, now what? Okay, now what? You did this, you did this thing, now what? And there, I think could be, you know, a, a, a desire to jump back into some creative um, expression because I prefer that space. But what I'm being brought to and thank goodness for my ritual practices and um, you know, I pull cards and prayer and meditation and my tree friends. Um, I just am, I'm really leaning on what is coming to me and what is coming to me is, yeah, it's not time to jump back into a big creative practice. Like that's, um, that will come, but it's, that's not the time. Now's the time to let this project be out in the world and to um, shepherd it uh, and let yourself be seen. So I'm getting to bump up against those edges as a somewhat uh, introverted extrovert or extroverted introvert um, and look at the ways that 
even though I, I am so committed and dedicated to the work of decolonization, looking at the ways in which the program lives in me, um, which shows up around uh, being an advocate for my work and putting myself out there and um, reaching out to people and asking to be seen. Um, you know, it's been very uncomfortable for me. And the good news is that discomfort isn't bad. And I am able to recognize that I'm in that healing process. Um, rather than I think a younger version of myself would be reaching for something that feels safe. Um, so I'm able to be in the discomfort uh, to feel the edge around emailing folks and asking to be on podcasts and reaching out to different bookstores and what have you. Um, I'm like, okay, whoo, here we go. Um and that has been what what this chapter is asking me to grow into that's that's the healing that's that's here for me to do um the good news also is that having done work around internally sourcing my belonging you know, it's so tricky because that old narrative shows up and that old narrative for me is like, you're not enough. And if you reach out to these people and they say no, then it proves that on some level. And that's the sort of like, unspoken narrative in 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 my head but it's full of holes when i actually am in the process because what i find is that it doesn't actually matter how many people say yes or no or how many people come to whatever event i'm hosting being in the work itself is so fulfilling for me and so coming back to that knowing in an embodied way is once again where I'm getting to challenge um, ways in which I've been conditioned to be smaller than I am. And that um, work around internally sourcing one's belonging becomes an anchor that I get to refer back to. So without that navigation back to myself, I wouldn't know how to do that. I wouldn't know how to be at a book signing and pause and turn in and be like, how am I doing? Oh yeah, I, this is enough. I'm enough. This is good, right? And so that work really shows up and supports me to be able to work these edges. There's so much decolonizing work in this phase of sharing art as well. Um, yeah, I, I'm feeling so sparked in what you've said, just in terms of reflecting on my own process of how do I continue my liberation practice, even as I give up my art to the world for them to see, consume, react to, judge, dismiss, <laughs> all the things, all the reactions that come with um, remarkable art or unremarkable art. And I'm realizing that in my best, I'm able to view the art that I offer as my love language as a form of caregiving. And in that I'm reaffirming my belonging and, and interdependence to those I'm offering art to. And understanding that this is how I short show care. This is how I give gift, not to be appreciated, although that's always really, really nice. 
but because that's just the person I want to be in service, giving of this art, this gift that I have. And that feels like such a decolonizing practice for me because it's making it less about me as the channeler, as the creator, um, and more about the care that it could offer someone who says yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. someone who wants to receive it. Yes. Yes. I love that so much. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And, and I feel like what you've named there is so important to like tease out or just sort of like um, highlight, underscore highlight. <laughs> um it really is a narrative of the program that if we create something, then in order for it to be successful, it needs to look a certain way. It should have a certain impact or it should generate a certain amount of income mm -hmm. um, or we should receive a certain kind of praise right and if it doesn't do those things then not only was what you created shitty a failure but you yourself are a failure mm -hmm. and i think that that pressure is so great for creatives i mean it's so overwhelming that it keeps us from putting our stuff out there because we are, I mean, oftentimes we're our own worst critics. So that's another piece of this work, but we're just so afraid that we're going to put our heart and soul into something and then be obliterated. Um, so we will either not create at all or create and keep iterating and never actually be done or um, yeah, put something out there and then feel like a failure if it doesn't give us the accolades, right? And what I love about what you're saying, because it really maps onto my experience as well, is that this is a heart offering. You know, it's like it comes from a place that's so pure and so well-intentioned and so beautiful. And to hold it as that, right? To hold it as, ah, here's something that I have to offer and I trust that it will go and do what it needs to do. And that is enough. Yeah. Is, is pretty profound, you know? And, you know, it, it might be like, so sometimes it's easy for me to think about things in the context of like something else, like a analogy. So it's like, oh, if you make a beautiful cake, you know, and it's like, oh, I made this beautiful cake. There's some sense that like, not everybody eats cake, right? Or yeah. not, and it's like, it's okay. It's okay. It's like, hey, you don't have, yeah, no, no problem. Oh, yeah. you hate, okay, well, then this is not for you. But then there are people who are like, oh my God, this cake is amazing. You make it for them, you know? You make yes. it for, for this sort of sense of understanding that whatever chord was struck with you and the creating of it, you know, like that chord will be resonant to others who you may not know, who you may not interface with. But it's like, it's coming from a place of your humanity. And so others recognize the human, the, the beautiful humanity in others. Absolutely. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So you put it out from that place. Yeah. Something that I, that I emphasize a lot in my own practice and with anyone I'm in conversation with around this, for me, recognizing my own humanity and what I create and allowing it to be for me first, like in this metaphor of the cake, like, am I delighting in what it tastes like as I taste along the way? 
am I delighting in the presentation of it and like enjoying it and savoring it before I offer it to others um, is a way that I'm able to be in communion with my own art and my own process, you know, like what's it like to really savor the process such that the outcome is not, you know, put on a pedestal so much as capitalism and our programming wants us to emphasize, like, what's it like to really savor the divine unfolding of, of being in that incubation period? Yeah. And I've heard this theme a lot that you're speaking about, Kelsey, that there are some of us who would rather be in the making rather than the sharing or the, the, the giving forth, which is absolutely necessary and important. And that's, that can be, but there's something about the making that, that feels so, um, rich and delicious and comfortable and easeful and gives us our time. And I'm, I'm thinking of my friend, Ray Phillips, uh, who talks about being pregnant and how she wants to be pregnant with, with a new book, or she literally just released, um, in proposal form, a recent book, and she's celebrating the rejections because, <laughs> because the exercise for her is putting it out there first, putting it out there first and advocating for her work. Uh, and that, that brings me back to the act of just like giving that, that is the medicine, that is the success, just the, the reaching out and offering and however it's received is however it's received by whomever wants to eat the cake or just look at it and be like, it's so beautiful. I don't want to cut into it, <laughs> you know, but I'm <laughs> totally. it. you know, um, that the offering is, is the, is the creative act sometimes. Um, and that it's okay to, to want to just be in impregnated and just be in gestation <laughs> for a while. <laughs> <laughs> totally. yeah. Yes. I can't wait to be pregnant unquote again um 100 <laughs> percent, yeah and there's <clears throat> I think there's also something important at least for me in like honoring the full process yeah you know it's like oh yeah I really like this stage but if I think about the cycles of things just like the cycles we see in nature the cycles we see in our own life right like there is a cycle to the creative process and um but if i'm not honoring the full cycle then i'm not really fully with the the journey that i'm on like i've abandoned it for some reason and it's okay if we abandon it but there's something to look out there <clears throat> it's like okay what what came up for you there you know and so um, yeah, I mean, I think that's another part of what helps me stay in the, in this phase of offering out is like a deep value around honoring the cycle of things, mm. right? The cycle of the release, the cycle of the fallow period, you know, Ooh, the fallow period, not often my favorite period but I'm like <laughs> ah but th this exists in nature this there's an intelligence here and mm. my resistance to it indicates that there's something for me to learn about this period or there's some way I've been something that's shaping me that's making you know there's something there to explore and so I want to be with the full cycle of of it yeah. you know yeah I feel like we could have a whole episode on the fallow period <laughs> You should do that. That'd be a good title of it's a deserved. podcast. You're right. It's, it's a stretch. It's a challenge for me as well, especially after being in the other cycles and or phases of the cycle. And also realizing that the cycle may span years or it may span a week or that's you right. know, a determined amount of time that it's not on my pace often. That's that's right. Totally. Totally. That's another part you know, that letting go. I would say my favorite part of the creative cycle is like the, um, like the, the, like the first shoot. Yes. The yes. beginning. Yes. <laughs> it's like, I've got something and, oh, this is good. And what's it going to be? What's it, where are we going to go? And like, I love that period. And one of the tendencies I have to watch it myself is like, um, just wanting to stay in that period. So it's like, 
oh, okay, now I have another thing, or I have another thing, or I have another thing, right? It's like, oh, okay, like, I really like this phase, but there's something for me to learn, and the becoming, and the maturing, and then the, you know, the releasing, and the, the letting go, and the, you know, so there is just, I mean, there, there's so much to learn about ourselves as we're in that journey. Yeah, I too really, really love that phase. And it reminds me of like the beginnings of a relationship where you're like, oh, yes. I feel butterflies. And I'm like, oh my God, what's going to happen? I'm so excited. <laughs> and I'm like, really like trying to dress up and look real cute. And yes. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 it's embodying the maturity and the commitment even past that phase into maybe the conflict that comes up or the the challenges that like emerge and like employing a little bit more grit to stay with it even through the the ruptures of the process yes. so, yeah yes. but it's such a oh, juicy youthful exuberant like sprightly Ye phase <laughs> yes yes and, I notice a lot of creatives getting stuck after that because there's this idea that it needs to stay that way. And yeah, going back to the cycles, it just doesn't, it doesn't stay that right. way. Right. Totally. Like there's something wrong if you're not like super, super excited about your creative project. I mean, when I was writing the book, there were so many days where I was like, I do not want to write today. Mm. No, but um, you show up for it. You show up. It becomes a practice. Yeah. Perhaps as a, as a way to begin to close here, um, can you offer something that allowed you to show up continually for it on those days that you didn't want to write? Cause I, I know there's a lot of, um, yeah that ask that and wonder that and want that motivation. Yeah. I think the first thing is that I had compassion for myself. Um, so I have a, a pattern around pushing through things. And so it was like, oh yeah, I could just push through, but what, what would it mean to like really stay with myself in this process? And so there was a gentleness that I required in my writing process that I wasn't just going to like grit my teeth and get through it, but that um, I would be kind to myself. And so one of the ways that I did that was um, I would say, okay, just 20 minutes, just 20 minutes. And if you want to go longer than that, great. And if you don't, then you've done enough for today. Mm -hmm. And that was re really helpful for me because some days I would be like, yeah, this was pulling teeth. I've got nothing. I'm done. But at least I, sh at least I did that. At least I, I showed up for that time com commitment that I made. And then many other days it's like, oh, you get back in there and, um, you know, like you end up going much longer than that because ideas are coming to you. Uh, another thing that I did to to make it as kind as possible is that I never stopped writing when I felt stuck. Mm. So even if that meant like um, erasing a bunch of stuff that I'd been working on and going back to the last great thought that I had, great. But I, I needed each day to open the page and reread what I wrote and feel like, ah, I could follow that trail mm. rather than like, oh, and now I'm in the mud puddle and I got to find out how to get out of this mud puddle. It'd be like, oh, let me, I mean, I might even end in an incomplete sentence that I know how to finish just because it gives me a sense of like, uh, um, not feeling defeated right away. Right? It's like, oh, okay, yeah, um, I know where I am. Mm -hmm. The other thing I, the other things I did were a little bit more like um, structural. So, you know, uh, having an environment that works for me is really important and really protecting that environment. So it was like, yeah, I'm not available. Um, and 
really having boundaries around distractions. Because when I'm like stuck in writing something, there's nothing I love more than a distraction. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yes, call me now. Who, why is no one calling? Oh, because I have my phone on whatever, you know, sleep or whatever. So um, yeah, I really had to to protect that. Um, and then I also, I used the Pomodoro app to write, which really worked for me because in those breaks, like it it would always be like, oh, okay, you know, um, I'm going to get a break, (laughs) you you know, and if I don't use the Pomodoro app, I would just write and write and write until I had no more, nothing else to say. And I was super exhausted. And so it really gave me a good structure of like um, some sanity around the process And sometimes I would write through my breaks. I'd be like, no, I have to keep going. And other times I was like, oh my God, I got seven more minutes before a break. So it just was helpful to have that. And then I would have like gentle goals for myself around on writing days, like sprints. It'd be like, okay, I want to try to write four hours today, you know, or I want to try to write two hours today. And then sometimes I would make it and sometimes I wouldn't. But for me, the overall goal was just, did I show up for my writing today? Whatever, mm-hmm. regardless of what came from it, did I just show up? Yeah. And that was the barometer of success for myself. Yes. Love that. I mean, I'm hearing the theme of like taking off the pedestal, the outcome and honoring the process of just showing up con- consistently. And then I'm also hearing the theme that you mentioned in relation to what decolonizing means and that's gentleness and kindness as a facet of it. Um, And it's really beautiful to hear how you embodied that as you were writing a book on decolonizing the body. (laughs) So um, know that the way Kelsey wrote this book was a process of decolonizing the body. And that's really beautiful. Um, So Kelsey, is there anything else you want to share for now that's on your heart that you would like to speak out? Um, I'll just say if anyone is dreaming of writing a book, I just, I, I want them to know that even if it feels like a lofty goal or like you don't have enough social media followers, or you don't even know what you would put in your book, that dream isn't something that everybody has. And the fact that that is alive in you indicates that there is a book in you and it's possible. Um, It can be done, right? And I think that such encouragement would have been helpful for me early on in my process. And, you know, there was a lot of having never written a book, even though I've written many other things, but never written a book. I I didn't know what the book was going to be about when I started writing it. I would be writing chapter three and I didn't know what chapter four was going to be. Um, and it felt like, oh, there must be something wrong with not having like a really clear structure, a really clear idea of where I'm going. And it was the support of my friends who were also creatives who were like, of course you don't know where you're going. <laughs> Of course, it's like, it's becoming, it's becoming. And I just want to offer that encouragement to your listeners. Like if, uh, if you're dreaming of a book, it's because a book lives in you. Mm. You can do it. Mm. Poco a poco. <laughs> Beautiful. Thanks so much, Kelsey. And we will share your contact in the show notes. So folks, please do check that out. And until next time. Thanks so much, Chetna. It was a real pleasure.